in Egypt. Today we're going to finish our study in Genesis and we're going to be focusing on maybe the most famous statement of Joseph's as recorded in verse 24 of chapter 50. And we're also going to look at a very similar verse in the New Testament. This, this verse we're going to look at in the New Testament is a verse that may be one of the most important promises you can turn to in God's word when trying to understand and come to grips with the purpose for trials in our lives. So before we begin, let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Father, for, uh, for bringing us here together this morning, Lord. We thank you, Father, for uh, this whole story of Genesis, Lord, and now completing it with the story of Joseph, Lord, and these, these words of wisdom that he speaks in the end, Lord, and these words that we're going to look at in the New Testament, Lord, that will uh, help us all, Lord, uh, as we deal with uh, uh, trials and tribulations and difficulties in our own lives. So, Father, we thank you for your word, Lord, and what it teaches us, the comfort that it brings us, Lord, and the words and the promises from you that we can rely on as believers. So we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord, that, that guides and teaches us in your word, Lord. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we left off last week with Joseph using some of those extreme measures to save the people from the famine, as was recorded in chapter 47. At the end of chapter 47, Jacob, knowing he is about to die, tells Joseph to bury his body back in the land of Canaan, back in the land of promise. In chapter 48, and I encourage you too to read these chapters, by the way. We're just kind of skimming over them. In chapter 48, Jacob blesses Joseph's sons. It's interesting to note that Jesus, excuse me, Jacob blesses the younger Ephraim instead of Manasseh, the older, when it comes to Joseph's sons. This seems to be in keeping with God overturning the expected order of things and having, again, the younger receive the blessing, just like Jacob, if you remember, when he was younger, and he received the blessing instead of his older brother Esau. In chapter 49, Jacob blesses his own 12 sons. However, in that chapter, he does rebuke his three older sons, Reuben for sleeping with Jacob's concubine many years ago, and Simeon and Levi for their harsh revenge on the men of Shechem. If you remember that story, because of the rape of their sister, they took out their revenge on the men of Shechem. Now, Judah, who we've seen grow from such a, a hateful, vengeful brother to a repentant brother who was willing to even take his brother Benjamin's place as a slave, now becomes the leader of the 12 brothers. And it is out of the tribe of Judah that who comes? Anybody know? Jesus. Messiah comes out of the tribe of Judah. In fact, Jacob tells Judah that in his blessing. So after blessing all his sons, Jacob does die at the end of chapter 49. Chapter 50, which is where our reading comes from today, starts with mourning over Jacob, and they do indeed take his body back to the land of Canaan. They bury him in the field that his grandfather Abraham purchased long ago. And then chapter 50 ends with Joseph dying, and so closing the story of the patriarchs in the book of Genesis. On his deathbed, Joseph tells his people that God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land of which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So, excuse me, Joseph reassures his people that God would continue to work in their affairs and expresses his continuing faith in the promises of God. He also makes them promise to bury him, his bones, in the promised land when they return to the land of Canaan. But... Before all this takes place, Joseph has an interaction with his brothers, and he makes a statement that we base our application on today. But before we do that, we're going to bake a cake. Okay? I need volunteers, at least a couple if I could, please. Who wants to volunteer? I only have one apron, so I won't... Okay, I got two volunteers. Okay, great. How are you doing? Well, I, that's why I didn't say what you're going to do until you volunteered. <laughs> awesome. You tricked us. Can I this? Like Brady? <laughs> so in a cake, and I am not a baker, but I know honey is. I know Deborah is. Deborah, when we're baking a cake, we use flour, right? Okay. If it's a chocolate cake, we'd use cocoa, right? And maybe some eggs, right? Okay. So what we're going to do is, when you mix all these together, and there's more ingredients than what we have here, you get a chocolate cake. 
However, the ingredients by themselves, when we begin, may not be the most tasty items yeah. in your kitchen, yeah. right? Yeah. Jackie's shaking her head like no, right? I, I do this every morning, every Sunday morning for Teresa when we make the breakfast, so I'm pretty good at cracking anything. <laughs> But so Jackie, you were shaking your heads. Like these things by themselves don't taste very good, do they? Well, Anakin always wants to eat it, and I don't let him. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad he's not in the room. He can take advantage of this. So what I want is a volunteer. I won't make you eat the raw egg because I know anybody gets sick. But someone taste that cocoa and someone taste that flour and tell me what that tastes I like. Love cocoa. I'll take that flour. <laughs> I know right. cocoa is a lot more tastier than regular flour. Like, look at his face. Yeah, he's not too happy either. Let's give him a big hand. Thank you, gentlemen. You might want to get a drink of water over there or go to the bathroom sink and spit it out. I'll swallow the eggs. It's like Rocky. So here's the deal. You have these ingredients that by themselves, by themselves alone, don't taste very good, do they? But when you mix them together, what do you get? Something you delicious. Something delicious. In this case here, the something delicious we get, this is like time-lapse photography. This is how they do it in the cooking shows. We baked a beautiful cake. I even put it in plastic this morning. This is what comes out of that. And this is what? Chocolate cake. And chocolate cake is what? Very good, isn't it? The stuff that goes in it, though, not so good. Until what? So you mix it together, and you bake it, and then you have something good. But the stuff going in, maybe not so good. Eggs taste good by themselves. Yeah, there's always has to be one in the crowd. Okay, do I, do I have your attention now? Is everyone paying attention? Okay, now let's leave this aside, and we're going to get real deep here. And we're going to look at a verse in the Bible you've probably heard before if you've been a believer for some time but a verse that we all need not to just hear, but to remember and to rely on when things get tough in life. Let's begin with our reading in chapter 50 of Genesis. We're going to read verses 15 through 21. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. They still have that fear of Joseph. And now their dad's gone. They think their protection's gone. So they sent messengers to Joseph saying, Before your father died, he commanded saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespasses of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Now therefore do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So in the context of Joseph's life and story in Genesis, Joseph tells his brothers that it was God who transformed the evil actions of a group of men into an exceedingly great work. Joseph not only saved the lives of numerous people in and around Egypt, he also made a way for the nation of Israel itself to survive. And he also testified to the power and goodness of God. God worked his good plan, even though the evil plans of people were there. Now, if you have your Bible with you, turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. If not, I think we're going to have it on the screen. Romans 8, 28, to me, is basically the New Testament equivalent of the words that Joseph spoke here. Romans 8, 28 is a very familiar verse to many Christians. And it says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, 
to those who are called according to his purpose. So what does this verse say and what doesn't it say to believers? And how can we use this verse to motivate us to get through those things in life that we don't currently understand how God could possibly use them for good? So let's start with the verse, what it does say, and in context. The first two words the Apostle Paul uses here to start the verse are, we know. The first thing is the certainty of the promise Paul is about to reveal to us. He is not saying that, that this promise is his opinion. It is a certainty with God. And then what is Paul referring to when he says all things? The primary reference of all things comes from verse 18 in Romans chapter 8. Romans 8:18 8, says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The phrase all things is referring to the sufferings of this present time in verse 18. So these all things are not necessarily pleasant things in life that we may look forward to, but the trials and tribulations that we must all go through in life. Romans 8.28 does not tell us that God causes people to suffer, and it doesn't say that God considers suffering in and of itself to be good. Remember what it says, that God will work these things, these sufferings, together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And don't get the idea that, that things in and of themselves automatically work together for good. Just like these ingredients, something has to be done to them to have them turn out good. God has to be working in these things for good. They are not good on their own. All things are not good. It would be a mockery to say that they are. The death of a child is not good. Cancer, drug addiction, alcohol addiction, war, all those are not good things. Adrian Rogers, a great pastor and author, he said to picture God as a chemist. God takes all of these chemicals that are toxic by themselves. He mixes them into a medicine that brings about healing. So God literally works all things for good. Now it's also obvious that this promise that we read in Romans 8.28 is for believers, those who love God. If all these things work together for the good for believers, our next question should be, well, what is this good that Paul is referring to? Is he referring to a, a good job, a, a good income, a, a generally good life? No, it's, it's really none of those things. The good is not to make us necessarily healthy or happy or wealthy, but to make us holy, to make us like Jesus. The believer's good is to be conformed to the image of Christ and reign with him for all eternity. And then what does being called according to his purpose mean? It doesn't mean our purpose. It's God's purpose. God does everything, even our redemption, in order to accomplish his overall plan, just as Joseph had to go through all those years of affliction in order for God's plan for the saving of the nation of Israel. Okay, so we've, we've examined this verse. Now, how do we apply it in our lives? And more importantly, here's the big question. Do you really believe what it says? Is God's word inspired by the Holy Spirit and Paul wrote it down? Do you really believe what Romans 8.28 says? If you're like me, there are probably been times in your life when you can't even begin to see how something that happened to you, something horrible, could possibly turn out for your good. And if some well-meaning Christian referenced this verse when you're right in the middle of this terrible tragedy, you may have been like me and just wanted to punch him in the face or call them out for being so insensitive to your trial. Here's a quick word of advice. Don't quote this verse to someone who's right in the middle of something or just coming out of something. It's way too early. There will be a time when this verse may come to their mind and comfort them. And for a very mature Christian, it may happen right away, but 
for a lot of us, it takes time. And that usually takes place later when this verse will mean something to them during that time of healing. Now, there will be a time when we do understand and we can see more clearly what Paul wrote here, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Let me put it this way. For most, hopefully all Christians, we know, I mean we know, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt, we don't hope or think or, or, or even believe, but we know that we have victory over sin and death because of the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross. We know that. We can bank on that. This verse in Romans starts with what words? We know. We need to know this the same way we know that. Just as we have victory over sin and death, we also have victory over circumstances in our lives. Knowing that God is working all things together for our good brings great comfort in the midst of the trials we face. And some of us maybe don't come to this realization until later on, and that will work. But here's some advice, and I say this to myself as well. Far better yet, learn this promise now. We talked about, you know, Christianity, what we do is almost like practice. We are practicing for those difficult times in life, for those things that will come about. This is that verse. Learn this promise now. Learn Romans 8.28 now. Embrace it. Lean on it. That you may have it ready when you really need to rely on it. Now I know, for me personally, sometimes it may have taken years for me to be finally able to see what good God had intended for me through a particular difficulty or trial. And maybe you're like me. For Joseph... It took 13 years or more. Here's another word of advice. Try your best to see what God has used that trial for through the power and through the comfort of the Holy Spirit. The sooner you see it, the better. And then the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will come over you. You know, several verses later in Romans 8, after promising that God will work all things together for our good. Paul concludes Romans with the wonderful fact that God's love itself, his love itself can never be separated from us. Let me read from you Romans chapter 8, verses 35 and then 37 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. If there are two things that you want to remember from today's message, it's these two things. First, God allowed whatever happened to you or may happen to you in your life because he is going to accomplish his ultimate plan and purpose through it. He will work all together for good for those that love him. And number two, God loves you. Do you know how much he loves you? How he sent his son to die that horrible death on that cross so he could love you? He loves you. What may have happened to you didn't happen because God forgot about you. It didn't happen because he didn't care about you. It didn't happen because he was mad at you. He loves you. And he was hurting or is hurting with you. God's love is everlasting. And his wisdom is infinite. In his ultimate plan for you and your salvation, no one or no trial can thwart his plan and purpose for your good. God will work all things together for good for those who love him and are called to his purposes, and that is a promise that you can hold on to. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Father. We thank you how those words that Joseph uttered to his brothers, Lord, can mean so much to us, Lord, as we look at Romans 8.28. 
And I just pray for those who who are going through something right now or or in the middle of it or walking into it that that we will take this verse and we will grab hold of it with our with your life. Like we're in a in a sea drowning and this is our life preserver. We'll hold on to this verse because somehow we need an explanation and we need a promise and it comes only from you. So Father, let us be a, a people that holds on to that promise. And better yet, let us be a, a, a people, Lord, that we learn this promise. We remember this verse. And when those trials and tribulations and horrible things happen in our life, that we can pull out this verse and hold on to it through that time. And then later on, whether it be days, weeks, months, even years, or maybe even in all eternity, we can see the good that you intended for your purpose, for those that love you. And we thank you so much for your love for us through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. We pray these things in his name. Amen.